morning, I'm Tom Gilligan, director of the Hoover Institution. For more than a century, our mission has been dedicated to generating policy ideas that promote individual economic and political freedom, private enterprise, and representative government. Today, we bring you our newest online virtual series entitled Hoover Capital Conversations. This series will bring Hoover Institution fellows together with policymakers for in-depth, informed discussions examining some of the major policy challenges facing the United States and the world. By bringing together the key players in policy development and policy execution, we hope to pull back the curtain on some of the discussions that have traditionally happened behind closed doors. I hope you enjoy this insightful and important fireside chat between those who generate the ideas enabling a free society and those who turn them into actionable policy. Welcome and thank you for joining us. As part of today's discussion, we'll be taking audience questions and I encourage you to submit yours using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Today we'll be talking about economic statecraft with Undersecretary of State for Economic Growth and Energy and the Environment, Keith Cratch, and Hoover Senior Fellow and former National Security Advisor, H.R. McBaster. Mr. Cratch took the oath of office as Undersecretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment on June 21st, 2019. The former CEO and chairman of DocuSign from 2009 to 2019, he is noted for bringing transformational leadership to many sectors of our economy, including factory automation, engineering, commerce, education, and philanthropy. H.R. McMaster is Fouad Michelle Ajami, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. He was our country's 26th national security advisor and served as a commission officer in the United States Army for 34 years before retiring as Lieutenant General in June of 2018. His latest book is entitled Battleground, Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World, and it's available for pre-order on Amazon. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for being here. Hey, Tom, thanks. thanks. And Keith, what a pleasure it is to be with you, and thanks for taking the time out of your super busy schedule to be with us uh, at Hoover. Real pleasure to, to see you, and I want to thank you for your service at this, at this critical time. You know, sometimes our government gets lucky when that we get the right the right leader in the right place at the right time, and, and yeah. certainly it, it's the right time as we can see with developments uh, in Hong Kong, uh, the results of the Communist Party Congress, and how the Communist Party is tightening uh, tightening its 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 grip on Hong Kong. And so, as Under Secretary, the first question I'd like to ask you is that you've really built, I think, on the national security strategy that we worked on during the first year of the Trump administration, with an emphasis on an economic security strategy. And I thought as we're watching these events develop, as we're in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, can you tell us more about what you're doing to, to ensure that America can maintain its competitive advantages uh, in this environment? Sure, well, well thanks HR. Uh, it's great to be here with you and Tom. Um, and I've got a great affinity for Hoover, I haven't spent most of my career in Silicon Valley. Um, and. Uh, there's no one I'd rather be discussing this with than you, HR. Uh, your thinking on China has particularly had a big influence uh, on me. And so to answer your question, Secretary Pompeo charged me with developing an operation, operationalizing a global economic security strategy to maximize national security, combat China's economic aggression, and drive global economic growth to advance prosperity and peace around the world. And uh, this is an extension of the national security strategy, which, uh, which you developed when you were a national security advisor. And, and this strategy can, contains three pillars. Uh, the first pillar is all about building off the foundation of success of uh, President Trump's uh, first three years in the administration to support the recovery of the pandemic and ignite a new area of, of growth and opportunity. And uh, it contains priority actions, just like the national security strategy does, for keeping America running um, and keeping America healthy, keeping America safe, keeping America working, learning, innovating, and investing. Uh, it also has new ideas in, in terms of economic stimulus to spur uh, growth and opportunity for the American people. Uh, and in HR, the second pillar is called Make America Strong and Safe, and it's a menu of policy options to turbocharge economic competitiveness and safeguard American assets. And so when we talk about turbocharging economic competitiveness, it includes investing in the American worker, increasing access to capital, accelerating the digital transformation, 
rebuilding our infrastructure, strengthening our industrial base, and extending our R&D lead in 10 critical technology sectors vital to national security. And when we talk about safeguarding our uh, asset, it includes our financial, educational, healthcare, and public research systems. And this means putting an end to China's wholesale abuse of intellectual property, uh, open markets, supply chains, and even stock exchanges. And I think one example we recently saw was NASDAQ tightening its, its listing um, to prevent the Chinese uh, and their companies from deceiving America investors about their revenues and their profits. And uh, this pillar contains a multitude of ideas to establish reciprocity uh, with every nation we do business with and strengthen our export screening, uh, prevent harmful technology transfer, and ensure that American innovation in critical technology sectors like 5G and AI are protected. And then the third pillar is titled form a network of trusted partners. And this gets to the issue of public-private partnerships and economic diplomacy by forming a coalition with our allies and our partners. Uh, the U.S. government can't win uh, the economic competition on its own, and we shouldn't have to. Uh, not when we, there are so many other companies and countries who share our values and our interests. And that's why this third pillar calls on U.S. companies to join the United States and our partners around the world and adhering to certain values and demanding that everyone they do business with adheres to them. And uh, I'm happy to expand on that, um, you know, on the rest of our discussion. But it comes back to what you raised in your question. And that is corporate responsibility isn't just social responsibility anymore, as we used to say. And, and it's also national security. And U.S. companies are on the global economic front lines. We need them to be first in line of defense to ensure that our assets and our economic interests are protected. And, uh, you know, since, since I've been in the administration, my first time serving in the government, as you know, and I'm really impressed with the work that's been done uh, to support uh, these companies and what we need to do uh, to win this fight against China's economic aggression. And Keith, thanks. You know, a lot, a lot of the, a lot of what you're alluding to in the in the pillars and in the strategy it involves a competition that was going on before even COVID started, right? And it, it seems to me like COVID has accelerated, you know, a lot of these trends, or has actually you know thrown back the curtain on some of the the Chinese Communist Party's behavior. It, do you see it that way? How do you see really what China has done in in this in this pandemic in the COVID nineteen experience? What can we learn from it about what the Chinese Communist Party is trying to achieve and, and the kind of, of economic aggression uh, that we've seen the party engage in? Yeah, and, and HR, uh, there's no doubt about it. And everything that we see uh, and gather from our intelligence that President Xi looks at this time of the pandemic is the time to accelerate their grand strategy uh, for global world domination. And, uh, you know, I borrowed uh, uh, one of your concepts from the Chinese Communist Party, the three-pronged strategy of concealment, co-option, and coercion. Uh, and I know you referenced that in your new unreleased uh, spellbinding book, which, by the way, <laughs> thank you for my early edition, uh, available in September. Um, <laughs> I didn't think you'd mind. Uh, so, so let me just, if you don't mind, I'm gonna answer your question by pointing out, this is a perfect COVID-19, uh, and what, what the Chinese are doing is a perfect example of the three-pronged strategy of concealment, co-option, and coercion. So as for concealment, we see how devastating the initial efforts <laughs> of hide the virus outbreak uh, you know, for the world, and the pandemic is a result of a concealment of the virus. They silenced whistleblowers, expelled press uh, from China. They've scrubbed social media of any mention of the virus. And by the time the world found out about it, the virus has spread uh, beyond control. And today, the CCP is using concealment tactics to shirk accountability. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Uh, it, it forced an apology and retraction from a EU, EU ambassador who, who wrote an op-ed saying the virus came from China. 
Uh, it's also attempting to shift the blame to the U.S. using state-run press outlets on social media to spread disinformation. Um, so let's move on to co-option. So um, their co-option is endless. And we've seen China attempting to co-op everything from supply chains to international organizations. It's attempting to use the UN and the WHO to spin a message that it's a generous, selfless nation providing hope in chaos. Of course, the truth is that CCP's humanitarian assistance pales in comparison to its for-profit sales of PPE, which average about a half a billion a day. So in a very real sense, China is co-opting the crisis itself uh, to turn a profit. Uh, in terms of coercion, uh, we see their so-called face mask diplomacy tactics of the CCP is uh, a force for countries uh, to support its aims. So for example, in Cyprus, uh, CCP donated 26,000 masks to various friendly political parties, and you can bet those donations were in self-interest. We also saw uh, their coercion in Miramar and into adopting Belt and Road projects in return for PPE. And in Bangladesh, local media reported self-interested uh, PRC donations to select Bangladeshi uh, political parties. And we're seeing this. We're seeing this all over the world. And I think citizens of the world are waking up to it. And that might be the one silver uh, lining. And it's given political will uh, to government officials everywhere. Uh, and we see very few uh, countries or companies are fooled anymore. Um, and so we're moving quickly to align our parties behind a common plan of action to head off this Chinese economic aggression. Well, Keith, you know, you, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, the, the sensitivity now, renewed sensitivity that COVID has, has exposed on supply chains involving you know, pharmaceuticals and PP and, and medical and so forth. And, and of course, uh, one of the aspects of the competition with the Chinese Communist Party that predated COVID was the competition in the area of communications and really concerns over data, data that we know that the party has systematically tried to exfiltrate through a sustained campaign of, of espionage, data that it wants to use, I think, in ways that would, that, that would, uh, that would leave us less secure uh, as a country, and data that it wants to exploit so it can get into a dominant position in the emerging data economy. And could you explain what you're doing in this arena of competition involving 5G, like hardware and, and, and architecture, uh, but also just more broadly in the area of, of communications? Yeah, and, and I mean, you're, you're, you're so right, uh, HR. I mean, if, if you look at what they're doing in the communications area, and, and by the way, I didn't realize until I went out uh, to Washington um, that uh, China has a National Intelligence Act that requires any uh, company, Chinese company, state owner or otherwise, and any citizen to turn over any information, proprietary technology, intellectual property, or data upon request to the CCP or to the government uh, or to the PLA or suffer the consequences. Um, and, you know, I've had my intellectual property um, uh, ripped off. And this whole area of 5G is such an important part of um, our communications infrastructure. And, you know, when you look at companies like Huawei and um, ZTE, it's really a Trojan horse. And, um, you know, we've got a lot of efforts in that area. As a matter of fact, uh, a couple Fridays ago, uh, we announced what we called the 5G uh, trifecta. And the first part of that was, uh, was the TSMC announcement uh, where they will invest $12 billion in the United States. And it's a massive sum to develop the world's most sophisticated five nanometer uh, chip fab in Arizona. Um, and, you know, one way of looking at it is this onshoring, what we were able to pull off is like a, a, a grand slam out of the park. And, uh, but more importantly, it is strategic because this means chips critical to our lives and national security uh, will once again be made in America, where the semiconductor industry was first invented, right where you, right, right where you guys are right now. And uh, the chips from this fab will power everything from the most sophisticated smartphones to the 5G base stations to F-35s. 
Um, so this will, you know, uh, this will create thousands of jobs up and down the supply chain and have a broad ripple effect. And uh, TSMC is going to train hundreds of workers. Um, and and uh, and probably most interesting is a really high skilled uh, workers. Um, over three quarters of the folks that work in the plant have master's degree or above. And there's also a phenomenon in the Silicon Valley business, in, in, in the Silicon business that um, uh, called clustering. And that's how Silicon Valley really became Silicon Valley. Um, so this TSMC deal is the first of many hopeful to come. And it's a powerful example of the way many companies are realizing uh, US is, is their most trustworthy partner. You know, the other thing that we did along these lines too, is we announced um, the foreign direct product rule in terms of closing loopholes on Huawei and ZTE from Dodge and exports. Um, and since its addition to the entity list a year ago, Huawei has continued to benefit from this loophole um, to make US electronic design software uh, and manufacturing equipment to continue producing its own semiconductors. So we shut that. Um, and, and that, that rule, uh, that ends with, with this new rule. The third thing, the third part of the trifecta is what Secretary Pompeo announced a couple of weeks ago, and it's called the Clean Path Initiative, the 5G Clean Path Initiative. And it requires all 5G data entering or exit, exiting U.S. diplomatic facilities to, tra to transmit only through trusted equipment and never through equipment from untrusted vendors like Huawei and ZTE and a clean, the 5G clean path embodies the highest standards of security against untrusted high risk vendors by blocking their ability to siphon sensitive information in the hands of the PRC. Um, and you know, the other thing we're doing too is we're encouraging all our allies and partners to join us and also private sector companies in requiring a 5G clean path. Um, and we're also, uh, you know, we think this is uh, some of the reasons behind some of the things that you're seeing uh, now with regard to uh, the UK uh, saying, hey, we don't want uh, untrusted equipment. Um, so uh, I think it's making an impact, HR. Well, Keith, thanks. You know, this is an area of competition that we were, I think, largely absent from because we had been operating under this assumption that there was an, sort of an arc of history that had guaranteed the primacy of our free and open societies, our free market economic systems over closed authoritarian systems and the statist economy uh, that, that, that we see with China. And, and you are really, I think, pioneering a way ahead on returning to that arena of competition and, of course, doing so in a way that preserves our, our free market principles and, and and, uh, and, and our innovation and, and our creativity as a, as a nation. I'd like, to, I'd like to ask you about the relationship with the private sector in particular. You came from the private sector. You're now re-entering this, entering this arena of competition, knowing, right, that this has to be almost a whole of society endeavor. You know, we have a, a program at Hoover called the Tech Track 2 Dialogue that I, I found immensely rewarding with, with Raj Shaw, Amy Zegard, and, and inviting together senior people from, from government and sen senior people uh, within founders, CEOs of, of tech companies. And it was a very vibrant dialogue, eye-opening, I think, on both sides with, as they share perspectives. What have you learned about the partnership with the private sector? What can everyday American companies do uh, to assist in this, in this competition to help preserve our free market economic system, preserve our competitive advantages, and, and return you know, to, this, to this competition? Uh, that, that has been kind of a one-way competition in, in favor of the Chinese Communist Party for, for quite some time. Yeah, HR could agree with you more. And this is a passion of mine, uh, having come uh, to government from the private sector. And, you know, our good friend Nadia Shadlow at the Hudson Institute, and your co-author of the National Security uh, Strategy, uh, told me during a fireside chat, she said I was a walking uh, public-private uh, partnership. So I wear that badge with honor. And, and, and China's economic aggression is the reason why I actually uh, first came to government, why I went to Washington. Um, uh, the truth is, I understand these issues facing US's, U.S. businesses really at a personal level. And, you know, I grew up in Ohio. My father owned a machine shop. You know, good times, it was there was five of us. And tough times, it was just me and him. 
And I saw how China's uh, weapons of mass production de devastated Midwest companies and gutted the SME uh, business, the heart and soul of our economic engine. Also, when I was a VP at GM, I could see that when you build a manufacturing plant in China, you're not just handing over the blueprints, but you're handing over the process engineering, you're training the people. And, you know, and then later, you know, as a tech executive, uh, I've had my intellectual property uh, ripped off by the Chinese. And I learned this is an occupational hazard for any American company, whether you do business with China or not. And now that I, you know, I can see the intelligence, uh, you know, at State Department, it's just beyond wireless comprehensive, how long they've been doing it, how systematic they are and what they've stolen. Um, and so with, with, uh, with this responsibility of heading up uh, America's economic diplomacy uh, made it a mission to get U.S. companies involved in our efforts. And so that, you know, one of the things I did was at the beginning of the year, uh, brought Secretary Pompeo to Silicon Valley for four days. And, uh, you know, he doesn't go anywhere for four days, but uh, uh, I think it was a great trip. And we had private conversations with numerous CEOs. I had a dinner over my home in San Francisco with 36 CEOs where we discussed not only does the CCP pose a real and urgent threat to democracy and national security, but a real and urgent threat to their business because China has picked out uh, high tech as the major battleground. And their objective is to put these great companies uh, out of business. Um, and you know, this, this was also when the secretary discussed uh, public-private cooperation at the Hoover Institute uh, as you know, you know, in his fireside chat with Secretary Rice. Um, so one of the things we've done is uh, private-public partnership is also a critical component of the economic security strategy. And the culmination of this is our vision that we call the Economic Prosperity Network, which is comprised of countries, companies, and civil society uh, who uh, share common values and it's operated under a set of trust standards. Um, and those are things that we would call American values. Europeans would call them democratic values. Around the world, probably a better translation is trust principles. And they include things like integrity, accountability, transparency, reciprocity, respect for rule of law, respect for sovereignty of nations, respect for uh, property of, of, of all kinds, res respect for the planet, respect for uh, rights of labor, respect for human rights. Um, and it's in all areas of economic collaboration, uh, whether it's uh, trade, commerce, money flows, digital energy, um, infrastructure, education, research. Um, and, you know, I think this is uh, proved to be um, uh, just, just a great something that something that when I in my um, 60 uh, uh, bilateral meetings with countries. It just resonates with, with them uh, because they share those uh, common and their natural partners. And it's really, at the end of the day, it's really about a trust because trust is the base of every relationship and you, and, um, you do business with somebody else uh, because you trust them. And so this idea, this network provides a tangible means for companies to partner in a whole of nation effort to defend economic uh, and national security. And we, you know, we know HR that CCP strategy is to seduce with money and reinforce with intimidation and retaliation. And there is strength in unity and solidarity. And it provides us always the strength in numbers as companies and countries seek to confront uh, the threats of China's aggressive retaliation tactics. And it's whether it's the NBA or what's going on in Hong Kong. Um, so I think, you know, that's probably one of the, the biggest core concepts, uh, you know, just by itself, HR. Thanks, Keith. I just want to remind everybody that we're going to go to question and answer here very, very soon. Uh, we're going to go over to, to Tom Gilligan, who's going to facilitate that, uh, that question and answer period. But as we transition over to Tom and ask everyone who's, who's joined us, to send in your, your questions uh, under the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I just want to say, see if you, if you want to say anything more about international cooperation, because this is a big debate, right? So, you know, the, you saw the headline in The Economist recently, you know, has, has China won? 
you you know you see the this narrative that well you know China really dealt with COVID much better than than happened in, in democratic and open and free societies even though we don't really know what happened in China because you can't really trust the data that comes out of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, I, I know you mentioned that, that you tend to get a, a positive reception, but what is your sense as our top economic diplomat of the degree to which we're, we're getting more international cooperation? And as Secretary Pompeo said, to frame this, hey, this isn't a U.S.-China prob problem. This is a Chinese Communist Party versus free and open societies problem. Yeah, I, by the way, I think you're so right, HR. You know, I think President Trump did a great job of waking up the U.S. in terms of uh, China's economic aggression and their malign uh, uh, tactics. But I think uh, now, particularly with the pandemic, the rest of the world is waking up. And, you know, and for us, you know, economic diplomacy with our partners is the bread and butter of um, uh, my team at the State Department. And that includes thousands of economic officers uh, stationed around the world. And, you know, I mentioned some of the early wins we've seen in 5G. And, and you know, this is including uh, with the UK, Greece. Those are two examples of how our work to help partners uh, understand economic and national security implications uh, for those who they do business with. And, um, and I think what's going on in Hong Kong uh, is also another proof of, uh, you know, what countries are realizing uh, through this pandemic. And it demonstrates a stark difference between uh, America and, uh, and all our other allies. And I think, you know, the things that we've been able to accomplish proves what like-minded partners can and must do to defend our interests. Um, and in all these bilateral meetings with these foreign leaders, um, I make the case that there is no sustaining prosperity without liberty. And, and that, that's the best way to secure liberty is to align themselves with strength in numbers and with the United States. And our economic prosperity network uh, is, a, is a new framework for countries to anchor themselves in the values of trust, freedom, prosperity, and rule of law. And the U.S. remains a beacon of hope uh, for freedom. And the world wants and needs us to lead. And that's exactly what we intend to do, HR. Well, Keith, I, and there couldn't be a statement more in line with, with Hoover's mission statement. Thank you so much for that. And thanks for the, for the opportunity to have this conversation with you. You were kind enough to plug my book, but I should say, <laughs> uh, I should talk about how much I've learned from my colleagues here uh, Larry Diamond, who's running a great, great power competition program, and Elizabeth Economy, who was with us yesterday, and whose book, The Third Revolution, is absolutely brilliant uh, on, on Xi Jinping and, and, and how he has uh, you know, oriented the Chinese Communist Party on this path to, to a closed authoritarian system, reversing you know, sort of the trend for, for gradual reform that we'd seen in China previously. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to have a conversation with you. And now back to to our director, Tom, and, uh, and, and to the audience, who I know has a lot of questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, HR. Thanks, Keith. You've spawned a lot of questions. I'm gonna ask some of the better ones, if, if I might. Uh, Christian asks, what are some key economic strategies America and its allies can use not to punish the Chinese people, but to alter the global misbehavior of the Chinese Communist Party? Yeah, I mean, I, I, by the way, the whole focus, is the Chinese Communist Party. And we have no beef whatsoever uh, with the Chinese people. We admire them, uh, we respect them, we love them. Um, the Chinese people through history, they've invented everything from spaghetti to gunpowder. You know, they have some of the best scientists, entrepreneurs, technicians, uh, culture. So it is aimed at that. And you know, one thing Secretary Pompeo said is that you know, we, United States enabled China's rise because we really believe that capitalism equals democracy and, and uh, they proved us wrong on that. Mm -hmm. And so it's time to take off those rose colored glasses and uh, treat, treat the Communist Party, not as we hope they'd be, but how they are. And that's exactly um, uh, what we're doing. And if you look, you know, here again at, uh, what they're doing in Hong Kong. That's the, you know, if they, if they follow through uh, with what they're talking about, 
Um, that's the end of uh, uh, Hong Kong's uh, one country, two system uh, rule. They, they lose their sovereignty. Um, they lose their freedom and they live in fear and, and total censorship. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it, it's the Communist Party. We know one thing is that they're hell bent on two things. Number one, first and foremost, is regime preservation. And the second is the stated goal, is that they'll be the dominant global superpower on their 100th anniversary of 2049, and just not an ordinary superpower. What they envision is an Orwellian state, I mean, authoritarian rule. It's like 1984. That's what they want to export uh, to nations around the world. I would imagine a lot of the economic strategies that we might use to affect their behavior is economic disengagement of some kind or another. Craig asked a question along these lines. If the U.S. and EU companies begin pulling their supply chains out of China, what's the likely Chinese response? Well, by the way, uh, I think one of the things you're seeing is what they're doing in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it was interesting because when we announced uh, the 5G trifecta, um, some uh, anonymous official uh, party member said they're going to retaliate against Qualcomm, Apple, uh, Cisco, and Boeing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a catch-22 uh, for that. I mean, I, you know, I think we're going to see that response, but I think we're prepared to handle uh, that response. And uh, we want to make sure that other nations uh, are ready for that response. Mm -hmm. And you saw, for example, you know, a seven word tweet by the, by the general manager of the Houston Rockets, sympathetic to Hong Kong within 24 hours, the $100 million of uh, sponsorships were dropped from the Chinese apparel companies. And all I know mm -hmm. is that orders like that got to come from the top. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is not even the country of China can move that fast. So they have a playbook for retaliation. And the NBA was a, was a, a visible one, mm -hmm. uh, particularly because they came back to the CEO, Adam Silver, and they said, we want you to fire the general manager of the Houston Rockets. And we also want you to issue an apology to China. Um, and here's the words we want you to use. Otherwise, we're going to you know, end up canceling your season. Mm -hmm. And for every one of those, there's about 100 other ones that we don't see. Yeah. Uh, and they go on every day. And they go on every day in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it's time we got to really stand up to that. Yeah. We also have to shine the light on ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a big one, for example, is um, in, the, in the financial system. So there's about 150 Chinese companies that are listed on the New York and NASDAQ stock exchange. Mm -hmm. And these are the only companies that don't have to do Sarbanes-Oxley and can't be... Uh, uh, third party audited. Now, as a guy who took three companies public, it kind of teased me off, but that's my own personal problem. But what's, what, what really upsets me is that uh, if you think of the, the ultimate constituency, it's U.S. citizens who own these uh, stocks and they've just gotten away with it for so long. And you, and you saw recently that um, TSP is not going to increase uh, their, um, their allocation of these Chinese stocks. And, and by the way, TSP is, is the pension funds for our warriors and our, our civil servants. And what we see is we see a lot of state pension funds, university endowments, um, funds everywhere, uh, reduce it mm -hmm. or totally eliminate their ownership of these Chinese stocks because they're not transparent. Yeah. Uh, and you can see that in, in Luck and Coffee, where they, you know, they totally misallocated and misstated revenues and profits. Yeah. So it's a big risk. And it's a big risk for, you know, great universities like Stanford as well. Sure. sure. Uh, Keith, uh, your last pillar had to do with finding reliable allies to partner with, with us in this endeavor. Terry has a question that speaks to that. He asked, how would you assess the willingness of our traditional allies in the European Union and Asia to challenge China's initiatives? My concern, Terry's concern, is that President Trump has picked a lot of fights with our friends, and they may not be willing to get behind this country and this president. By the way, that, that's a good question. And um, 
I, I can tell you the demeanor has changed. Uh, and I've had a lot of recent dialogues, for example, with officials of the EU. And they go, you know, we've got our differences in trade and those kind of things. But the big existential threat uh, is China. And I think uh, Europe is particularly waking up to that. You know, it was interesting. Uh, one of the first trips I went on was over in Germany, and I had a, a closed door session with 25 German CEOs. I'd come to know a lot of those, uh, you know, folks over the years um, uh, in my duties as, as, as CEO. Um, and when you close those doors, they understand that China's economic warcraft doctrine uh, is one of, um, uh, like we were saying, it's one of, one of concealment and, and, and deception, mm -hmm. and also one of parasitic relationships. And, you know, their strategy was 1949, they attached the parasite onto Russia. And then in the early 80s, you know, they attached the parasite on the United States. And now it's squarely on the back of countries like Germany over in, in the United States. And I think um, they're, they're waking up to that. And, and you can see all kinds of things. They bought their number one robotics company. They snuck up and became a huge shareholder of the national treasure of Germany, which is Daimler Benz. Um, uh, so I think, I think, I think they're realizing, uh, realizing that. And I think countries are, are around the world. And I, you know, I think we've, uh, it's part of, it's important part of my role in terms of economic diplomacy um, with these countries. And there's nothing that's more united than uh, a common rival. Yeah. Uh, Keith, here's a couple questions I'm gonna combine. They have to do with building our strength to enable us to engage in this competition. Gordon, Gordon says, to blunt Chinese economic aggression and expansion, it would seem we need domestic production for critical materials and a strengthened supply chain. To achieve this, we'll need competitive labor, which will require advanced AI, robotics, automation. How do you see these, in, how do you see these investments uh, towards this rolling out? And Christy asks, how is state, the State Department, bringing AI into economic statecraft and the three pillars? Yeah, so, um you know, with regard to supply chains, I think that point is spot on. And, you know, the supply chain shifted over a lot because of the, of the labor differences. It's not as much of a factor as it is anymore, be, exactly because of the point of automation and things like robotics and uh, AI and uh, uh, flexible manufacturing systems. That was the world I came out of. Uh, I ran a ro ro robotics company in the early 80s, which is now the largest manufacturer of industrial robots in the world. And I've been focused on productivity my whole life. And so that's, a, that's really a big factor. And it's also something that uh, our team is very focused on is, is those supply chains. You saw some of the result of that with, for example, TSMC. Um, and we're working uh, uh, not only with the interagency, but uh, with the top consulting firms in terms of analyzing key critical supply chains in areas like pharmaceuticals, rare earth minerals, um, uh, automotive, uh, semiconductors, um, and in all those areas. Because, you know, I mean, we've woken up and, and looked at how they've, uh, how they've entangled those. And uh, you know, that was part of their overall uh, strategic plan. So I think you're seeing a lot of things now, for example, the United States Congress um, to really rally the troops and do some of the things necessary to help our U.S. companies bring those uh, supply chains back or pull them out of China. I don't think you've seen any um, uh, uh, U.S. companies expand their manufacturing uh, capacity or production facilities um, in, in the last, you know, over the last couple of years. And you've seen a bunch of them come out, ones like GoPro and those kind of things. And they either go to uh, uh, our ally partners, GoPro case, I think they went to Mexico. Um, so, you're, you, so you're seeing that. And uh, I think that's vital in terms of our, uh, our, our national security. Mm -hmm. the, uh, we have a lot of questions about 5G. Uh, Sri Ram asked, are we, are we, how encouraged are you by the UK's recent repudiation of Huawei, and what is our government's plan to assert our competitiveness in 5G? PJ observes, 
But what does a competitive US-led 5G package look like to match the spread of Huawei, ZTE, and the dependencies it creates? Yeah, and by the way, I think that's a great question because as, you know, as a Silicon Valley, you know, entrepreneur, this is, this is probably the first major paradigm shift that we missed. And, um, and there's a lot of reasons behind it, but there's no doubt in my mind that we can catch up. Uh-huh. And, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, and we've spent a lot of time talking to a lot of the um, tech leaders who are focused on this particular area because it create it's going to be such a big industry right. and, um, and it creates such a great opportunity. And up to this point, uh, it's what scared everybody off was that, uh, China was just treating Huawei and ZTE as an extension of the Communist Party, which it really is. And so they were subsidizing the heck out of them. And, and, um, uh, you know, and and so their aim was just to put, uh, you know, the three major suppliers who are right now, Nokia, Ericsson, and Samsung, out of this business. Mm -hmm. And now I think when you've seen some of the moves we've made to neutralize uh, those untrusted vendors from China, yeah. it actually creates a pricing imbe- uh, yeah. umbrella and creates a great opportunity. And you're, you're going to see, uh, you're going to see no doubt in my mind, uh, some great innovation come out of uh, Silicon Valley companies mm-hmm. uh, uh, along the lines of 6G and advanced uh, telecommunications equipment manufacturers. We're talking to them, you know, almost on a daily basis. Yeah. Can you speak to the question about whether you were encouraged by UK's re- recent repudiation of Huawei? Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it, uh, we were scratching our heads um, originally on this because, they're, you know, they're part of the five eyes. We share intelligence with them. Uh, yeah. uh, and we actually shared the intelligence with them yeah. on uh, some of the things that Huawei have, do- have done. I think, and they're sophisticated enough to understand, like everybody in Silicon Valley understands, that at the end of the day, it's all about trust. Yeah. And, you know, uh, their sales guys talk about, oh, we'll, you know, uh, uh, we'll sign an agreement, no back doors. Well, in that business, which is the software business, there's a front door every day because they're changing up the software yeah. every day. So it comes down to one thing and one thing only. It's like, who do you trust? And so for the, for the European telcos, I mean, do you trust two, Europe, uh, two European uh, 5G uh, providers? Yeah. Or do you trust these two uh, companies that are run by uh, former members of the PLA where they have a National Security Act? So yeah. we're, we're, I mean, it's really highly encouraging. Um, and, uh, we're, we're, we're beginning to see that all over the world. Good. Let's end on one last question about your third pillar. Eric asked, is there an effort underway to grow the number of countries in the economic prosperity network, potentially com- countries from Africa, Europe, or Latin America? Yeah, absolutely. So it, 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 if, if you look at, um, uh, this effort, um, uh, and when I, uh, and you know, a year ago when I was sharing this, uh, at its conceptual stage, uh, with so many uh, in, my, in so many of my ba- bilateral meetings, and I had a, I had literally a ton with the African nations, South American nations, South Southeast nations. Um, I'll tell you a response I got from one South uh, East Asian uh, uh, finance minister. He goes, "Finally, United States has an alternative." to the one belt, one way toll road to Beijing. Um, and I think what they understand is this is a unified and equitable uh, alternative to that one belt, uh, yeah. one road uh, initiative. And, you know, <clears throat> I've, ha- I've been fortunate enough in my career to build two networks. One was the Ariba network, which now has $7 trillion of commerce going through it on an annual basis, more than all the trade in Western Hemisphere. And the other is the DocuSign Global Trust Network that now probably has 800 million unique users and literally hundreds of thousands of companies to standardize on. And when you're building a network, there's always three objectives. Number one, uh, maximize the number of nodes. Nodes are our members because the power of the network is the, the number of members squared. The second one is to reduce the friction between the nodes. 
software business, it's like ease of use. It's also um, trust uh, standards. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing with the um, Economic Prosperity Network. The third one is to maximize the value for each one of those nodes, for each one of those members. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're putting together prosperity partnerships for uh, developing nations um, that uh, don't just include our regular tools out of our diplomatic toolkit, but also uh, the United States great uh, private sector. And when I say private sector, I don't just mean business sector. I'm also talking about educational sector and the social sector. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at things like uh, uh, Habitat for Humanity, the Gates Foundation, uh, Opportunity International, it's the biggest issue of microloans in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this really means a lot. Um, and then wrapping, wrapping all those things uh, around that. And, you know, the United States is the most generous um, uh, country in the world. I mean, it just dwarfs what any other country's done. And the one thing, though, I can tell you that we're not good at in the United States government, we're not good at marketing ourselves. Yeah. And we need, to get, we need to do a better job of telling that story and branding good old USA um, because we've done so much uh, good for this world for so long. Great. Great note to end on. Keith, HR, thank you guys so much. What a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Tom. I really appreciate you having me in HR. Thanks so much. And I, thanks, I, I Tom. So thanks, much Keith. to you and the folks at Hoover. Good. Thank, thank you thanks. all. And I want to thank the audience for attending today. And also remind everybody that our next Hoover Capital Conversation will be with United States Senator Tim Scott, and Hoover Senior Fellow and Medical Doctor, Scott Atlas, on June 10th at noon Pacific and 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, they will be discussing health policy and COVID-19. You can sign up at hoover.org forward slash capital conversations. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the discussion and I hope to see you next time. Good day. <laughs>